All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Greenlight Guru True Quality Virtual Summit, the three day event designed to provide actionable takeaways you can implement in your own company to innovate faster, stay ahead of regulatory changes, and use quality as a strategic asset to grow your device business. This session is on design considerations to maximize medical device cloud connectivity. And my name is Taylor Brown, medical device guru here at Greenlight Guru, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We've got a really special session scheduled for you today, and I know our speakers, Keith Drake and, and Chris Dupont, are really looking forward to sharing their valuable expertise on the advantages of considering connectivity early in the design process and key factors medical device manufacturers should consider. Now, before we take a deep dive in today's presentation and introduce our speaker, I'm going to touch on a few items first. First of all, this session is going to run about 45 minutes in total and will include a Q&A session at the end where Keith and Chris have been kind enough to answer your questions. So I encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation as they may come up uh, in the box on the right hand side of your screen. And we will get to as many as time permits. Don't worry, this entire session will be recorded. And once this session wraps up, there's going to be a 30 minute break before the next live session begins. Now, and if you're interested in learning game changing product definition tactics, which sounds super exciting, I encourage you to make sure you're registered for the following session and use your unique link to tune in. If you aren't already signed up, don't worry. You can register for the next session and over 20 others at virtualsummit.greenlight.guru. I'd also like to share a few words about Greenlight Guru and why we put on this free virtual summit. If you've been to one of our training sessions before, then you know that we put these on because improving the quality of life is our mission here at Greenlight Guru. Anything we can do as an organization that helps device makers bring safer, life-changing devices to market quicker and with less risks aligns with that mission. We're constantly looking for ways to fulfill that mission, whether that's through hosting free events and training sessions, through partnering with world-class medical device companies like Galen Data, or through our award-winning medical device QMS software. If you'd like to learn more about why medical device companies from across the globe are moving away from paper-based general purpose QMS and adopting our purpose-built medical device quality management software, I encourage you to head over to greenlight.guru after today's presentation to schedule your free personalized one-on-one -on -one demo. In doing so, you'll learn how the very best medical device companies are leveraging our purpose-built quality management software to gain ISO 13485 2016 certification, market approval, breeze through audits, and push beyond just compliance to produce true quality medical devices. So if you're interested in learning on how we can help your device company Make sure you visit www.greenlight.guru after today's webinar and schedule your free personalized demo. Now, on to the bulk of today's presentation. Let me give proper introduction to today's speakers. First up, we have Chris Dupont, and he is the CEO and co-founder of Galen Data Inc., a configurable, scalable, FDA-compliant software platform that enables connecting medical devices to an FDA-compliant cloud. He has over 25 years of experience developing sophisticated technology in the medical device industry, including cyberonics and the aerospace industry, including NASA and Iridium. As a project manager and principal software engineer for venture funded FDA class three medical device company, he was responsible for executing key software projects through a formal design control, verification and validation process in compliance with FDA regulations. He also has involved with numerous class three medical startups in which various roles and started the commercially successful life science division at Titronic Software Inc. He has co-authored and submitted seven, seven US patents covering patient management and threshold optimization software applications for implantable medical devices. He has initiated and led the effort to achieve ISO 13485 certification for two separate companies, which included building from scratch an ISO compliant uh, medical device and ISO 14971 risk management system. He's joined today by Keith Drake, Vice President of Business Development at Galen Data. Keith has 35 years experience managing the development, marketing, sales, and delivery of health information technology. He provides experience guidance to medical device entrepreneurs and manufacturers for device connectivity, cloud computing, 
and data storage, cloud analytics, and FDA compliance. His prior experience includes integration of point of care test devices within the hospital setting, medical automation systems, now Abbott Labs, and interoperability between commercial labs and electronic health systems, Quest Diagnostics. His responsibilities included leadership of business development and management for several information technology forms, firms, coordinating a broad range of resources to meet corporate needs regarding business process improvement, product life cycle plans, marketing and sales processes. Now, before um, I hand it over to Keith, just again, thank you guys so much for attending today's session. Without further ado, let me hand it over to our presenters, Chris DuPont and Keith Drake. Taylor, thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity. And Chris, that's an impressive resume. I didn't know you'd done all that. Uh, thank you, Keith. <clears throat> let's, let's launch our discussion today telling you just briefly, and Chris, I'll ask you to, to take this slide. Tell us about uh, who Galen Data is and what we do. Uh, thank you, Keith, for that introduction. Uh, Taylor, thank you for that. And everybody out there in the audience, uh, it's my honor and privilege to be here. And, and I know you guys are all super busy. So thank you for making the time. Uh, to carve out a little bit to learn about Galen Data. Galen Data is a configurable, scalable software platform that makes it easy to connect medical devices to an FDA-compliant cloud. We do it in a, in a, at a fraction of the cost of schedule along with providing a host of other services. Now when a medical device manufacturer decides to connect, they simply model their data in a data model or using our platform and have connectivity in a matter of weeks. From a platform perspective, Galen takes care of all the FDA regulations, ISO standards, cybersecurity, and HIPAA requirements. Galen is also certified to the medical device quality management system, ISO 1345. Back to you, Keith. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let's lay some groundwork for our discussion today. You know, medical device connectivity, design considerations. I imagine that most of our audience is early to mid-stage medical device companies. So let's first discuss what we consider to be a connected medical device. First of all, a medical device that we would provide Galen Cloud connectivity for is a wearable or implantable electromechanical gadget, something that either senses physiological data from the patient and or applies a therapy such as a neurostimulator. Now that's a very broad definition, but it helps narrow our discussion today. In short, anything that the patient uses that provides input and or output data, we consider a medical device, and that includes near patient equipment such as a, a CPAP machine. Connectivity, pretty straightforward. Again, a broad definition. Um, that medical device uses computer networks in any form, and Chris will provide some some color around that here in a couple slides, uh, to transfer, manage, store, and or analyze any type of health data. So health data, let's, uh, let's do a little bit deeper dive into that. What is health data or more specifically, what is medical device data? From our viewpoint, it's a very complex question because the answer is so broad. Here's a summary of what we consider to be medical device data. First and foremost and most obvious is user physiological data, typically referred to as vital signs, measurements of patient body function, temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, brain activity, things like that. There's also user therapeutic data. Um, this is information that would come into the device that would in turn drive therapeutic treatment of the patient. Example, a neurostimulator, the signal parameters sent to the device that in turn apply that neurostimulation ther uh, therapy. Number three, and this is somewhat overlooked uh, in the customers that, that we deal with, at least initially in the early stages, is user demographic data. This is device output. It's, it's information that characterizes the patient, but it's not directly measured by the medical device's sensors. Things like height, weight, age, exercise, sleep activity, all important information that should be considered when we're talking about design considerations for cloud connectivity. And then lastly, and this is where the light bulb really goes on for a lot of the clients that we work with, especially in the earliest, earlier stages of our partnership, is device status data. Uh, parameters that indicate nothing relative directly to the patient, 
but about the device itself. Examples include things like battery level, other device specific information, as, as Chris likes to say, and I'm stealing your line here, Chris, uh, and, and you'll touch on this throughout your part of the presentation, there is no check engine light for a medical device. There should be. There are very good health and business reasons to provide a check engine light for a medical device, and cloud connectivity is the missing piece to provide that capability. All right, let, let's switch gears a little bit. This is a characterization of a lot of the clients we work with. They are really smart people. I, I enjoy our engagements because I learn a lot about the medical science, the engineering technology from our clients. But what we found is there's almost a myopic focus on what you see here at the bottom, core functionality. Verification that their device actually meets technical requirements. Validation that through clinical trial, the device does what it is supposed to from an effectiveness and efficiency standpoint. That's a very important milestone in the maturization of a device, but I would suggest it's not the real goal. The real goal pushes through market clearance where regulatory quality as provided by Greenlight Guru, you know, issues involving your device history file, design controls, and all the regulatory requirements that wrap around those market that lead to market clearance, a very important milestone but it's simply the stepping stone to the last stage, which is market acceptance. Does your, provide, does your device provide true usability and cloud connectivity? Uh, we, we are finding that cloud connectivity, connectivity of any sort is, not, is no longer a nice to have, it's a need to have. It needs to be included in the medical device, early planning, design and implementation because it's required for market acceptance. So here's a kind of a summary viewpoint of what we feel beyond getting your device to work and getting it through clinical trials. The key factors for market acceptance. Down there in the lower left, you see regulatory. Um, if you do not have a regulatory consultant, you should bring one on board. Uh, maybe somebody on your team already has that regulatory expertise. You need that as a constant reminder that regulatory is an important stepping stone to market acceptance. Up the top, quality, that's where our good partners, Greenlight Guru, come in. They have the industry-leading, extremely fantastic uh, quality management system. Uh, highly recommend, if you're not already a client, to take a, a close look at Greenlight Guru. And then in the lower right is connectivity. That'll be the focus of uh, our discussion today. These factors, regulatory, quality, connectivity, they are not independent. They should be considered in concert. They overlap and they complement one another. So we're gonna get a little bit better understanding of who you guys are. So let me ask you a poll question. What is your current connectivity focus? Up at the top, you've already got connectivity, it's well in hand, it's implemented. Or perhaps connectivity uh, is in design development. You're considering it, it's an active part of your product development path. Maybe you're definitely planning on connectivity, but not taking any specific action yet. You're not sure if you need connectivity or not. And then lastly, you don't feel as though you need any connectivity. We're gonna wait for the results to come in here. I see them rolling in. This is very exciting. We'll give you about another five seconds or so to consider generally where you are along that spectrum and give us a response. And we'll go ahead and close out the poll. And let me take a quick look at the results. So I see the results are pretty much as we have expected. Uh, most everybody falls into the definitely planning on connectivity, no action yet, or not sure if you need it. So Chris, I, I think we're, we're speaking to the right audience here. With that, I will turn it over to you, Mr. DuPont, to uh, dive into the specific topic. All right, Keith, thank you for that handoff. Three key design questions device companies should ask. Should my device connect at all? What's the risk? What's the reward? What platform design options should I consider? Is Amazon Web Services the HIPAA platform? Is that enough? Maybe, maybe not. What market opportunities should I consider? 
would my medical device have an edge over the competitor if I had connectivity? Something to think about. Now, should I connect at all? Uh, yes, there are, there are risks in connecting your medical device. There's privacy concerns, cybersecurity concerns, but if you follow the industry standards, such as performing regular penetration testing, encrypting your data when you transmit, encrypting your data when you store, following the HIPAA guidelines, that goes a long, long way in meeting the privacy and cybersecurity requirements. I believe there's far greater risk in not connecting than connecting. I'm the father of three boys. If one of my sons, and thankfully he doesn't, but if he had epilepsy and he was at a restaurant with his friends and he had a seizure, the technology is out there today to indicate when a seizure happens. An alert could come to me, it could come to the physician. Uh, and I wouldn't want to know about that because I could take proactive action uh, if my son was having a seizure. So I asked the question, is it more risk to not know when your son's having a seizure or having a seizure? Another example is when I was in the class three stimulator business, uh, I'd have to support clinical trials and commercial sales. And our device would last up to nine years. And there's something called high impedance when you wrap the helical coil around a, a nerve and we apply electrical energy. There's something called fibrosis that creates a resistance between the electrical contacts and the nerve. And over time, that fibrosis would create high impedance or high resistance. And at some point, our battery wasn't strong enough to deliver energy into the nerve and we were underdosing. Our use case is our patients would first see the physician after implant every three months and it would go to six months and sometimes even longer. What happens if you're in that six month period and you start having high impedance or high resistance and you're underdosing, Or maybe you're not dosing at all because of a lead rate. That disease state could return. You might not know about it. And so again, I asked the question, what's the risk? Is it, would you rather know when you're underdosing or if you have a problem with your device or not at all, or wait three months or longer when you go in for your regular visit? So something to think about. I do believe connectivity risk can be mitigated. For example, Galen is mostly a read-only platform. Technically, we can write, but we make a business decision, a cybersecurity decision, where we read information from the devices and we just simply display them in various formats, but you can get that information at remote locations. I think that goes a long way to reducing cybersecurity risk. So I believe there's huge opportunity and in, in middle device connectivity, and we'll talk about some use cases. So what platform decision should I address? We have components, we have communication, and we have software. So in my world, there's two types of devices. Mostly there's wearable tech and there's implantable. Uh, most devices today, uh, the wearable tech use Bluetooth to communicate to a docking station or a phone, and then that sends that information to a cloud. We're working with some co co companies now that have actually built in the cellular technology to the wearable device, uh, eliminating that secondary plot, that secondary dot platform, or docking platform or mobile phone. And then we're, we're aware of a couple implantable companies that, it, that is using Bluetooth to communicate. Smartphones, uh, as smartphones become more and more popular, there's something called medical device or software as a medical device. And so there is not really a device at all. There's an algorithm that's running on a smartphone. You use a camera, turn a light, and you take a picture of that disease state. And then that, that phone can analyze the data there, or it's more of a collection device that takes the data and just sends it off to the cloud for processing. And we'll talk about some of that later. Communication, uh, Bluetooth is common, Wi-Fi, Zigbee could be also a use out there. Cellular, MIX, let's talk about MIX for a uh, little bit. MIX stands for the Medical Implant Communication Service. Uh, FCC approved this in about 2000. Industry started adopting it a few years later. It broadcasts in the 402 to 405 megahertz range. It has a distance of about two meters in communication, and it's specifically designed for medical device. I was involved in a, in a mix program on an implantable device about nine years ago, and a lot of the other companies uh, that I was associated with were also adopting mix. There's some specialized hardware that you have to use, and, and there's other advantages and disadvantages. Today, of the 30 or 40 companies that we're personally touching, I don't know of anybody using Mix. Now, I'm sure there, there are companies that are out there that are still sustaining it, but I don't know of any new technology that's implementing Mix. It, it may be, but because Bluetooth is so widely available from everything, uh, I know the wearable tech companies 
are implementing Bluetooth, and I know implantable companies are implementing Bluetooth. And some of the engineers out there will say, well, what about the attenuation? That is an issue, but these companies that at least we're working with, uh, they think they've resolved it. Software. Um, let's go back to the data analysis. So as you know, most mouth devices are small in nature. They're limited in data storage and limited in horsepower. If your device is connected, you can send that data to a remote location, a cloud, where essentially you have unlimited horsepower and unlimited storage. And think of it not just from a single device. Think about it of the entire population of the device. If we're doing an epilepsy study, you could collect, there's just a ton of data we have to collect. We could store that on the cloud, and then we could use predictive analytics. An example I like to use is a heart pump. Uh, most heart pumps aren't connected today. And imagine if you had a vibration sensor on that heart pump, or if you just were measuring RPMs, and you had 1,000 LVADs, 1,000 heart pumps implanted, you're sending that information back on a regular basis to the cloud, and you had predictive analytics. Your vibration sensor, or in combination with your RPM sensor, detects some perturbations in your RPMs. Through predictive analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you sense a problem, and you're looking at the entire population, 1,000 heart pumps worth of data, and you can predict that serial number 321 is going to have a catastrophic bearing failure in three months. As you know, heart pumps, the patient has minutes to live if there's a catastrophic failure. So think about that, is that if you can offload that data and do deep analysis, you'll be able to predict device failures. Operating systems, they're all common, Microsoft, Android, iOS. If you bound how your device works within the operating system, uh, that's what most companies are doing today. 10, 15 years ago, we'd have to buy custom real-time operating systems and do verification. Uh, I think there's actually less risk in using commercial systems that millions and millions of people use. Smartphones. Uh, we see mostly people deploying to Androids and iOS phones. Uh, and this can be an issue in that it's just that there's a, these phones change every six to nine months, a year, you get a new model, a new OS. And when you think about iPhone 8, 9, 10, 11, and then you have iOS 12.4 and 13, then the combination of Androids, the com combination of devices that you deploy on is a non-trivial problem. It's difficult to support all these different combinations. There's a language out there called Xamarin, spelled X-A-M-A-R-I-N, that allows you to write a single code base that you can deploy to both the Android and iOS phone. In theory, and, and largely in practice, you cut your verification and testing in half. Let's move on. What market opportunities uh, do I consider? And so uh, we're overriding. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, it's, it's less of a technical design issue. We obviously can connect. There's lots of opportunity out there. It's more of a regulatory. Uh, in medical device, we're very concerned about regulatory, the risk reward of connected devices. That's changing. So what we're going to do is we're going to brainstorm on a couple, three opportunities here. And we've all been watching the news. We've all been stuck at home. We've seen these people line up in cars four or seven hours to drive under a white tent to get their nose swabbed and wait two or three weeks to get the results. Going forward, I don't think that's acceptable. Uh, we all can check our bank accounts in seconds. Why can't we have remote access to our data in near real time? And so I think the industry, and there's going to be an emerging market for medical device connectivity uh, because there's no reason. The technology is there. We just have to figure out the regulatory um, opportunities and work through those. Reimbursement. So the first use case is, from a practical point of view, is that say you're the CEO of a sleep monitoring company, and you have to get reimbursement. Medical device is third payer systems. So to get reimbursement, you have to show objective evidence that your device is being used four hours a night. How do you do that? Uh, if your device isn't connected, it's very hard. You take the information to a flashcard, it gets lost, you take it to your physician, it's just very cumbersome. If this new sleep monitoring device can check in once a day and report objective evidence, it's easy to prove to the, to the third payers that your device is being used. Or we have limited resources on this device. It could be a $100,000 device. And if the device isn't being used and you can prove it, you can pull that back from the field and redeploy it. So from an insurance point of view, from a manufacturing point of view, I think it optimizes the opportunity. Uh, the second case, compliance. We used to get issues when I was supporting our implantable device. We would get a, a complaint from the field. 
And we'd have to send out a rep to go to the site, to talk to the physician, get a hold of that physician programmer, download the data, and send it back to the factory. The fastest we ever did that was two weeks. Normally, it was a four to eight week process. It's a very expensive time to do. If your device can check in once a day, there's no longer sending reps out, getting the data, and pulling it back. You can get that diagnostic data, the database, the patient history in real time. Another issue with another opportunity for compliance is sometimes when you're in clinical trials, you have great efficacy, great results. When you go into the wild or the commercial world, uh, you don't see the same results. It's not that people, it's not that the device isn't working any less. Most likely the patients aren't using the device as prescribed. So say that device is supposed to be used 20 minutes a day, how do you know? And so if the device could check in once a day, twice a day, you'll have the opportunity to help with compliance. Human error, we used to support uh, clinical trials where a physician, a clinician, we had a system they would transcribe from the physician programmer to a piece of paper into the statistical package. We would spend hundreds of hours sometimes chasing down complaints when it was actually just a, a human error transcribing the information. If that medical device could transmit directly to the cloud and then into, into the statistical package, you have that opportunity. One, you're more efficient. Two, you have an opportunity to reduce human error. And then my favorite is device diagnostics, uh, monitoring the health and status of a medical device. And as Keith mentioned, is that there is no equivalent of a check engine light. And so we all drive modern cars. Your engine light comes on, says you have a low tire pressure or an issue with your engine. You can get actually alerts to your phone or the alerts go back to the manufacturer to address the concern. That doesn't really exist today in a medical device. And so the real use case that I'd like to just share with you is our device would be implanted from up to six to nine years. And it's actually pretty tough to predict exactly when a battery will expire in a medical device. The curves are very flat, and then you have a sharp knee. You have about a three month time period to predict when there is not enough battery left to power that device. And so if you're not seeing your doc, but every once every six months, your device could fail and your disease state could return. And so that's the worst case. But what happens if your algorithm's wrong? What happens if your predictor says that your device is going to expire in three years when you actually had three years left? Now, implant, costs for implants are very expensive. Typically they're $25,000 just for the device and the leads and the programming system, and then another $25,000 for the implant procedure, you're looking at $50,000. In addition, there's risk with infection. Uh, whenever you go under the knife, there's just those risks. If you can accurately report, if your device checked in once a day, here's my battery status, here's my battery status, and over a lifetime, if you could maximize three implantable procedures instead of five, the insurance company just saved $100,000. You just reduced your risk by reducing the uh, having to do unnecessary implants. And so there's a risk if you explant too early, and there's a risk if you let the device die. At that point, I think we're bumping up against our time, so I'm going to hand back over to Keith. Thank you, Chris. Uh, appreciate that. And I think you've given our audience a lot to talk about. We've really just scratched the surface here in device connectivity, cloud connectivity, and the design considerations that our, our company should be considering at this point. What we'd like to do is announce our Galen Cloud Incentive Program. This is an opportunity for you, our audience, to determine if the Galen Cloud meets your needs. Uh, we will provide a fully uh, operational Galen Cloud environment at no cost to you for two months. Uh, there are certain qualification requirements uh, that we'll go through if, if you uh, decide to take advantage of this offer. Uh, there's gotta be some technical maturity of your device, You'll, uh, we'll ask that you make a, a resource commitment internally to exploring the Galen Cloud during this uh, incentive per, uh, period. The program eligibility period ends at the end of August, so it's through the summer. Uh, two things you can do if you're interested. In your consoles here for the webinar, to the right you should see a, uh, a link for handouts. In that, in that uh, the handouts area, you'll, see, you'll be able to download both the slide deck and this marketing piece specifically. Or you can simply send an email to incentive at galendata.com. Um, I'll also come back to the theme that we've really just scratched the surface. There's so much to talk about. 
What Galen Data made a commitment to uh, several months ago was the our medical device connectivity innovation webinar series. We've already had a couple. You can see our timeline here for the next five uh, medical device connectivity webinars. Each takes a deep dive into a very narrowly defined topic. Uh, so the next one, Medical Device uh, 2020 Outlook, is on June 23rd. You can visit our website and sign up for that webinar. Lastly, before we uh, turn it over to Taylor to launch our Q&A session, is what we suggest for your next steps. Again, hopefully we've given you a lot to think about. Here is what we would suggest as your punch list moving forward here in the near term. First of all, number one, Think about how your device aligns with cloud connectivity. As Chris mentioned on one of the slides, your device could be the actual device and or a cell phone app and or a base station and or supporting algorithm in the cloud. That all encompasses to the, uh, med comprises the medical device. So think about those technical and design issues, the platform considerations that Chris talked about. Think about that longer term and final goal of market acceptance. How might cloud connectivity provide you with competitive advantages and business opportunities? And do not forget, always include quality, that's where Greenlight Guru comes in, and regulatory issues. They, they support each other and they're a critical part of what you should be thinking about now. Number two, uh, include connectivity in your specific design, in your development uh, pr uh, processes, in your business planning processes. Everything I just mentioned, Make a commitment to integrating that within your weekly uh, cadence as you march toward uh, releasing and launching your device in the community. And number three, and I consider this to be the most important, let us know how we can help you. Uh, I, I often say we're not looking for customers. We're looking for partners. We're looking for partners that you know, provide us with financial compensation in return, we provide value, but we're looking for partners that we can march down this very challenging road together with. We learn from our partners. We hope you gain value from us, but we gain value from you as well. If we can help you in any way beyond the incentive program, beyond the, um, the, the two month trial period, please let us know. Our contact information is here on the screen, our email addresses, our phone number, visit our website. We're here to help. With that, Taylor, I will turn it back over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Keith and Chris. Great discussion on cloud connectivity. Uh, audience and, and team, as you come up with those last minute questions as we're wrapping up here, please feel free to submit those uh, in the right hand panel of your screen. Uh, Keith and Chris, I have a, a, a pretty general question that I just want to get your feedback on. You know, we talk about an early focus on cloud connectivity. At what stage? Um, in the medical device design and development process, would you say it's a good idea to start having these conversations with Galen Data? Yeah, uh, great question, Taylor. So uh, it's kind of what we talked about brainstorming. So if part of your business model to help facilitate reimbursement, to help us help help facilitate facilitate that equivalent of a check engine light or compliance, then I would almost include you know once you have your basic therapy working. If cloud connectivity is a key, port, key part of your system, then the earlier you, you could include it, the better. Uh, because a lot of sophistication could be on the, on the analytics, the algorithms analyzing the data, and you got to flush those out. And so the sooner you can get to a working bench model, like we always try to do in engineering, uh, I think you're, you're farther down the road. Understood. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we've had a couple questions on, um, of course, a, a question on validation of cloud software. So one question asking, is it mandatory uh, to have cloud software FDA ISO 1345 certified? Uh, and then just general tips and tricks on, on how to roll out and uh, respond to those product updates through the cloud to uh, maintain compliance. Yeah, that's a that's another great question. So there's three class of it, gross classifications of medical device, class one, class two, and class three. It's a little fuzzy when you cross over from class one to class two. A Fitbit, for example, as long as you're using it for, for health and well-being, it's not a class two. But if you want to use that, that Fitbit information on how many steps I use in a heart study, it starts to blur and you start to cross over that line. What I always suggest is, is take the higher road. If unless if you're absolutely a class one device, um, and even then there there could be some opportunities. 
But when you cross over that boundary as a class one, class two, class class two to class three device, uh, design controls come to, into, into effect. And in a lot of the, the ISO 1345, a lot of that is just good engineering practices. 20% um, of it may not be applicable, but a lot of it just makes sense. So, and, and I know that when, when we're looking for vendors, if they have their ISO 1345 certification, we would consider them at a higher grade than a company that does it. It's not mandatory, and I'm, I'm not saying it is, but it puts you in a position of strength uh, if you have your design controls in place, if you have your quality management system in place, and if you reach that higher higher standard. Taylor, I see a question that, that I really like, if you don't mind me, me uh, reviewing it. Question, and this is for you, Chris, how does the FDA view today implantable devices that are connected to smartphones running iOS or Android from a safety and cybersecurity stand, uh, viewpoint? And, and perhaps, Chris, you could wrap into your answer, you know, the penetration testing we do and the other security and cybersecurity mitigations that we already have implemented in the Galen cloud. Okay, sure. So as far as smartphones, it's, it's really a two-part answer. If you have a primary device, such as a physician programmer that interacts directly with the implantable device, and then they're sending that information to a secondary device, such as a smartphone, uh, that's less regulatory risk because you're just, you're a secondary device, you're not the primary device, and so you have some flexibility there. But more and more, we're seeing more and more companies use smartphones as, as primary viewers, as, as even as programmers. And so what you want to try to do is you have to follow the design controls for a class two, class three device, um, follow the ISO standards. And, and the industry is clearly going into more and more of using smartphones. Uh, the challenge is, is that the smartphones, the iOS, is, the platform itself is a moving target because it's always being updated. So that's the bigger challenge. Uh, but from a, our experience is more and more companies are adopting smartphones. They, you, you still have to fully test the software, define it with requirements and risk analysis, cybersecurity. Uh, and again, it goes back to that risk reward. You can do a lot of things to minimize, such as being a read-only system when you display that, that information. And Keith, did I get that all? Or did, was there another follow-on question to that? I, I think that's it. We've got a lot more questions that springboard off of that. Uh, a good one here. What are your thoughts on AWS as a controlled cloud platform for your connected medical device such as a low risk device? So AWS, Amazon Web Services, it's a phenomenal platform. It has multiple failover capabilities. And, and as you know, they also have a HIPAA component to it. But that is just a slice of the pie. And, and it's a great tool, it's a great foundation. Um, but it's just one small piece. Just because Amazon is HIPAA compliant, you still have to, have to satisfy, there, there's a regulation called design controls, and I keep mentioning that, 8020.30. Any software, any GUI, any database that you build on top of AWS, and if you're in the class two world, class three, it doesn't relieve you of, of, of that very expensive custom software design cycle. There's a software standard out there called IEC 62304. And so if you deploy your software, you have to be compliant with that if you're class two, along with the ISO 1345, along with design control. So AWS is a phenomenal platform. It's great that it's HIPAA, but that's probably just about 3% of the total effort if you deploy microbiased software to AWS. And Chris, um, a lot of that effort, and this, this goes into the next question, a lot of that effort is in privacy, security and privacy. A specific question is how are HIPAA requirements maintained when uploading patient info to the cloud? Another great question. So HIPAA is, is it's, it's also a operational standard. For example, you, and this is where ISO helps you, is that if you have your ISO certification in place, you're going to have a, a, a process that says, my employees, only the minimum amount of employees that I need to maintain my system have access to patient data. All other employees are restricted. You need written procedures to protect that. You need re written procedures for backup and failure. Uh, you need written procedures on how you encrypt data, how you protect your data. And so HIPAA is, is more than just technical, it's also operational. And that will vary from company to company, 
but those are written procedures that you should have in place along with all the traditional industry standards of cybersecurity, pen testing, um, and encryption. Another question on penetration testing. How often do you uh, conduct penetration testing internally, quarterly, and on an annual basis at least? We try semi-annually to have an external organization perform pen testing. Um, our last penetration test was mid-April, and we did extremely well. Um, Chris, would you need to validate a cloud provider, such as Galen Data, as a non as non product software or as part of the product as part of the medical device. Yeah. So uh, the another great question. So Galen is is built with all these standards from day one. We were built from scratch before the very first line of code was written for the Galen platform. We were following uh, ISO 1345. Within a year, we had a certification. All the different medical device standards. And this is what we've been doing for a long time. We're built in, and so from a platform perspective, what Galen does is we issue certificates of compliance that we're compliant with all these different standards. Now, your data model that you create that is different, and you will have to qualify or validate that data model. But for, as far as a platform, that's Galen's responsibility. If if the FDA comes back with a new interpretation or a new standard, it's Galen's responsibility to make sure we have that. If a third party library we're using to do a graphic display, if that changes before we can adopt that, that library into the Galen platform, it's our respons responsibility to verify it. And then, as Keith has said, is that we, we view our, our customers as partners in, in that our first, the very first thing we do in, in pursuit of their regulatory pathway in support of that, we issue the certificate of compliance. If the FDA comes back and says, Chris, we need to see the, the regulatory uh, risk analysis or the detailed design uh, for your platform, on a case-to-case -case basis, Galen will make their internal documentation from our DHF, our design history file, available for that partner in support of their regulatory pathway. And so we do 95% of the heavy lifting when it comes to the platform. You still have to qualify your data model that's specific to your therapy, to your device, but that's, a, that's about a 5% of the effort of instead of trying to build your own platform from scratch. It's a great question. Taylor, can we go about two hours long? Because there are so many good questions that, that are coming in here. We're not going to have time to answer them all. And for those of you whose questions we're not answering, uh, don't have time today, we're going to work with Greenlight Guru to try to get your contact information to directly respond to them. But in the two minutes we have left, Chris, can a class one device be a connected device and collecting and monitoring data? Absolutely. Uh, some class one devices and just for the audience uh, out there class one class three is life sustaining class two is where if I if I interact with the human body or if I make a medical diagnosis that's class two class one typically is no matter how I use the device I can't hurt you such as a tongue depressor uh, but with that being said even on class one devices depending on the device you're still obligated to do design history files, keep complaints, possibly even have a CAPA system. So I always recommend Greenlight Guru is a great platform. Even on class one devices, just from a good engineering perspective, having some good project management in place and procedures and routines and documenting your design puts you in an absolute position of strength. So yes, um, a class one device could definitely leverage the Galen Cloud for sure. Taylor, do we have time for one more? Take one more and then we're wrapping up. We have one minute left, Chris. It's a great question. How does Galen Data see embedded cybersecurity for software as a medical device and medical devices actually showing operational cost savings for a company? And what is the level of security at, at a private cloud platform? Is Galen Data open to partnering with a security company? Wow. Uh, There's a lot great there. Question. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, from day one, Galen was built with all the medical device standards in place, along with best practices of cybersecurity. We encrypt in transit, in store. We do external pin testing. Uh, we would love to have a conversation with a security company uh, if there's something there. We like to talk to everybody, so we're, we're happy to have any conversation about medical device. I'm passionate about medical device, been doing it a long time. And uh, if we can help bring a device to market better, faster, cheaper, 
Usually you only get two of those, not all three, but I think Galen can, can get you better, faster, cheaper through democratizing an FDA compliant cloud that was built out of the box for class three micro devices and class two and class one. Perfect final words there. Keith, Chris, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Greenlight Guru and Galen Data, um, thank you all for attending today's session. Uh, be sure to check the calendar for upcoming sessions. And I think next time we're going to have to make this an evening length conversation. So we appreciate your time, Keith and Chris, and, and look forward to uh, all the follow up that will occur after this session. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Greenlight Guru. It's a wonderful opportunity, and we look forward to uh, talking to everybody in our audience today. Perfect. And thank you, everybody, for spending time with us. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.